Welcome, Wargamers, to the maddeningly diabolical plots of the Mortal Realms, because today we're talking about a very low-key subplot woven within the Flesh Eater Court's battle tome that is entirely new to the faction. I briefly kind of mentioned this in my last video, but it has to be talked about separately because it has setting-wide implications. In short, to not bury the lead, Neferata, the Mortark of Blood, is actively poisoning cities of Sigmar with the blood of Ushoran, specifically to drive them mad on the inside of defenses and create a populace that is primed for control. If that does not hook you with intrigue or narrative possibilities, I'm gonna be honest, there's nothing left for you on this channel. I, I love learning about cults, like subplots that can be pulled on later on for like the meta narrative of the game, intra-faction politics, plots, betrayal, it's the best fodder for storytelling. And this one really does hold up. So let's dive a little bit more into Neferata, her plans, how it all works. But before we do that, I just want to say if you're interested in this game or anything Age of Sigmar, please consider using one of the affiliate links in my link tree description down below. With every entry, you'll see exactly how much money you'll save by using that link. And every time you do, big or small, at no cost to you, a tip goes in my tip jar. This is the best way to support me, my wife, our cats, since I turned off ads here on the channel. Thank you so much to everyone who has used those links so far. I also want to throw a shout out to Goonhammer. Although this is much more of a lore discussion, Goonhammer is going to have a ton of great tactics discussion, model reviews regarding all the stuff coming out for Flesh Eater Quartz, so go check them out. So for those of you who are new to Age of Sigmar or this particular faction, we need to kind of set the scene for the events that are going on since Broken Realms. That's the last kind of narrative campaign that happened. Nagash did his big epic spell, the Necroquake, which saw ripples of, you know, death magic and motes of it saturate the realms. Uh, death factions, notably the Soul Blight Gravelord, saw a huge boom. And after a big yada yada, Nagash goes toe to toe with Teclis on his home turf, loses, is struck down, and Nagash needs to coalesce for a while. He's still alive, and he can manifest parts of himself, which is how we can use a 900 point model on the table. But really, he's in, he's in the timeout box for a little bit. Once Nagash's safety was secured, the Mortarks Manfred and Neferata immediately began, shall we say, thinking outside the box. When the boss is asleep, we get to do whatever we want. We get to conquer the mortal realms our way, not his. Because creativity is the hallmark of good leadership and problem solving. And while we are not told directly what Manfred's up to, Neferata has a very compelling plan. And this plan really begins to set in motion with the return of the Mortark of Delusion, Ushorin. Now that Nagash has been under for a little bit, Ushorin, also known as the Carrion King, the Summer King, and the Mortark of Delusion, felt it was safe to reveal himself and try to reunify his scattered empire, all the, the various courts of flesh eaters across the realms. We talked about this, the, the very nature of the flesh eater court's delusion. It begins with vampirism. Then that vampire, aka the ghoul king, enraptures their immediate surroundings with a unified vision or delusion. His blood is then fed to some of these people to create royal families or lesser vampires, or you could just eat it and you start to mutate and change. And that's how you get things like crypt horrors and crypt flares. Okay, we talked about that to death, but not only are we keenly interested in this, so is Neferata. While Ushoran is feasting or in his mind, you know, giving epic speeches when he's really just standing there coughing, growling and, dro and drooling, Neferata had like death magic masked servants drain very small amounts of the Mortark's blood. I mean, he's got sores all over him. It's not hard to get a sample of his blood. Then again, I don't know, at the rate at which they're taking his blood, he must like fully go into a, a fugue state when he eats, which I do understand. But like, bro, regardless, uh, his, you know, his Icor is harvested, bottled, and distributed, priced to sell. Now you might be thinking to yourself, who's buying this? Who wants Ushorn's blood? Well, the answer is, of course, rich people. So now we're going to move from Neferata's observations about, you know, basically his blood, Ushorn's blood, seems to be able to 
to share his delusion even outside of his intent. So he doesn't have to try to make someone a vampire to drive them crazy. If they just ingest some of his blood, they kind of go that way anyway. So that's her observation. How does she weaponize the Summer King's blood? So she uses her scouts and spies and stuff like that to disseminate the blood amongst the cities of Sigmar. They sell it as king's blood, quote unquote. Um, basically, this is a super rare vintage of wine. You can't get it anywhere else. Top of the line. Basically, everyone's vying for it. And here's the thing. You might open the bottle and be like, huh, this seems like a bottle full of guts. But you feel stupid for having spent that much money on it. So you're at least going to taste it. And the second you sip from the cup, you're locked in. It tastes amazing because the delusion has just spread. So now it's not a jug of guts and blood, it's like holy water or fine wine, whatever they sold it to you as. You're locked in, buddy. So they take the blood, they spread it to cities. What happens to these folks who have, say, a bottle or two of king's blood? Well, for starters, anyone who directly drinks it is inside the delusion, meaning they are super on board with everyone else who has drank in it because now the delusion is coherent. Again, they're all locked into the same visions. And they start to have these like dreams that kind of wrestle in their sleep of, you know, visions of a grand feast, of a world without fear, a resplendent king, and it fills them with hope and joy. So of course, like good people, they want to share it and they keep it going. So maybe, you know, what started as someone just wanting to try an exotic drink spreads into, you know, wine tasting clubs because they want everyone to experience this. And soon a little group or cult will begin to form. Just groups of people that are locked into that delusion, could be from any strata of society, but they're slowly devolving while trying to multiply. Because remember, the more you ingest a vampire's blood, the more you start to change. This is how you end up with things like cryptors and flares, so changes are going to start happening eventually. They may not happen as fast because they're not saturated in death magic by having like the vampire right there, but it's happening. And these cults are cool because they can look like a lot of different things. They could be um, culinary masters that come together to try exotic foods. Maybe one of them brought it in thinking... Here's a super rare spice that I got from this, you know, super shady dealer who said she got it in Akshi or something. And all of a sudden, boom, we got a whole bunch of gourmands that are like super feral. It could be a church service that had a very fancy wine. Could be a lot of different things, but what they all have in common, no matter what the delusion is or how it's introduced, disseminated, or how it grows, at some point, given enough time, these people will devolve into cannibalism. Some will hide it better than others, or have more opportunities to spread the madness given their position in society or their job or so on. So it really depends. It is kind of a, a wild buckshot strategy, but I mean, you're talking about vampires who play the eternal long game. It works. Because not only are people getting eaten, with some folks like just getting eaten by other people who are totally crazy within the populace, which is a problem in and of itself, but this also means there's like a tiny death faction cell inside the cities of Sigmar. And that is territory that was traditionally taken up by Zeech cults. So it's getting crowded, is what I'm saying. The only reason there's not a lore book about the corn fighting club that every single city of Sigmar has is because you don't talk about Fight Club. Anyway, if Neferana wants information, now she has a cell inside the city to get it. If she needs to cause a distraction by letting, you know, the cult wild, she can. Even if it's not a military thing, she just wants this city to be like so busy looking inwards that they don't notice or can't stop her armies from passing by. That's a fantastic use. If she needs them to open the main gate so that her army can walk in and launch a full attack, she has that. In fact, there's an event that's depicted in the book, um, in the battle tome rather, called the War of Red Errantry, which is also known as the Cannibal Crusades to Sane People. That's a direct result of this. Think of it as like a dark mirror to the Dawnbringer Crusades, led by Cardinals of Ushuran, a religious movement. And basically it went through, it was like a, an army that was just walking in a straight line and it 
old citizens of several cities and outposts together into a giant snowball of an army that then flipped on their friends and family once the Summer King showed up. So they all got crazy and all these little cults and stuff started pouring out of these cities because they're like, I'm being drawn by visions or whatever. And the second Ushorin shows up, they go full flesh eater court. They're locked in. It gets real dark. So that's the subplot that was added to this book amongst other ones. And let's talk about why it's cool. First off, Neferata is awesome. Nephi is my girl. Because think about the situation she's created, right? She's essentially doing what Nagash's orders were, which is to you know, go forth and multiply. She's creating little pockets of, of death armies everywhere that are just ready to use. And she is more than happy or content to keep leading Ushorin by the nose, building up his force until it becomes something useful that she wants. Neferata loves her schemes and stuff like that. So if she feels like she can guide Ushorin, yeah, he's an asset the stronger his armies get. So she's going around and basically spreading his blood, his influence, his corruption in a way that weakens the cities of Sigmar as a whole. So her armies can also usurp that and use that to their advantage, but also boosting assurance numbers every single day. So this Mortark of Delusion who's been gone for so long is now becoming more and more of an asset and restored to what he was supposed to be. And I like it, because from one perspective, it could be how the Mortark of Blood decided to raise, you know, her fallen brother back up, effectively rebuilding his, his kingdom. Whether he knows it or wills it is irrelevant, but in the end, it serves the cause of death factions everywhere. More vampires is good, more death magic is good, more pawns on the table for Neferata is good. I, for one, would adore a, a Callus and Toll book, uh, which is like just a series of characters who go around the Age of Sigmar universe. But basically, I would love it if they stumbled into a cannibal group. And just like the rough mental image I have of that scenario is like Hugh Jackman from the movie Van Helsing kicking open the door to like a room full of Jeffrey Dahmers in the middle of a Thanksgiving meal. Like, Let's go. Let's do this. Anyway, that's enough from me. This is the thing I wanted to share because one of the things that's cool about this new battle tome is I feel like they went out of their way to add so much more character and plots to the Flesh Eater Courts. Instead of just being like, they're crazy and some are crazier than others and some are dead and some are not, they really kind of put them into the context of the setting of like, not only do they exist and they're on the upswing because now Nagash is down, Ushorin wants to rebuild his kingdom, but at the same time, they are being used. Like there is a greater plot going on here. And I thought adding that to the book just made it better. It was, it was just a straight up improvement. Their influence exceeds their armies. And I love that about Nurgle too. Like Nurgle can, can move into an area just by having a nasty rainstorm and corrupt it. He doesn't need the army. Infection can spread far away from where the army is. In the same thing here, now you're talking about people just going insane in a city. And you have no idea why, but they're having weird visions of a king and grandeur. And when their army arrives, they might open the gates thinking like, our heroes are here and, and that kind of stuff. It gets so weird and twisted. I love it. Anyway, friends, let me know your thoughts on this plot down below. What kind of book would you like to see? Uh, kind of built in surrounding it. I think just the way it's written with like the Neferata spies and stuff, it's it's firm material for that kind of book. Probably not from the Flesh Eater Court's perspective, of course, but like the setting is all there. Let me know in the comments down below and I will chat with you there. Thank you so much for watching and listening and I'll catch you next time. Happy Wargaming.